Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, today, we have an amazing guest, Marcia Lopez, who is the owner of Women's True Healing, which is a healing center in LA for female reproductive wellness, um, which means that she works with female reprodu reproductive dysfunction, infertility, sexual trauma recovery, et cetera, et cetera. And um, Hi, Marcia. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Thank you for being here with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what's really cool with you is that you are a shamanic practitioner and yeah. herbalist. Would you also yeah. say energy worker or does yeah. that kind of fall into? Yeah. Energy worker, body worker. Um, I definitely fall in the field of traditional curanderismo. I'm a curandera. And I am, I'm applying this work in this modern day setting and also making sure that I can translate this work into uh, allopathic medicines. So I have a lot of referrals with actual doctors and fertility specialists and acupuncturists and midwives and nurses. So I do traditional mestizo indigenous based practices, but uh, putting them in modern context. I mean, you are such, such a gem. That is incredible. And from what I understand, you, you also blend your immense knowledge and experience with your own healing and recovery journey, mm -hmm. which means that you're able to create a super safe and incredibly empowering space for, for the women that you work with. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you go on your website, one of the first things you see is a quote that goes, the health of the woman is the health of the tribe for all her fruit is blessed. And yeah. I love that so much. It reminds me of, of another quote that goes, um, the world will be set free by women who are free, who I believe was said by the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I personally just so deeply believe that when, when, nothing is truly going to change until women and those who identify as women begin to heal themselves, uh, heal their traumas and then rise up. And from that powerful and non-judgmental place begin to just fundamentally change and rearrange things and eventually blast the freaking roof off. So I was really curious why you put that quote on your website. Well, it's a blend of a couple different ideas, but I was trained in womb massage in particular, and uterine massage by the Arvigo Institute. Um, and the Arvigo Institute actually has taken indigenous knowledge, Mayan knowledge from the Belize, uh, from the uh, Mayan Belizean people, the Quiche, and they were able to capitalize it here. And back when I learned it, I actually wasn't able, I didn't have the funds to fly to Belize at the time, but I had the funds to fly to New Hampshire. So I flew to New Hampshire and, you know, it would definitely was odd, Emily. I'm like, okay, I'm flying to New Hampshire to learn the techniques of part of my bloodlines, right? Because my family's from Guatemala and we have, you know, definitely closer, uh, if, all right, we, if any indigenous bloodlines that we have would be Mayan. Um, but there we learned about the man that taught uh, this work to um, our, to Dr. Arvigo, who then brought it here. And he had a quote that said, um, gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm blanking out on the quote, but it was about the uterus being the cosmic portal, right? Mm. And it's like a stargate. So we all, uh, we all come through the womb. So whether the person who has the womb is, is female identified or whether we are, you know, you know, cisgendered, female embodied, the womb is still the organ that we just stayed in, right? And so that's the cosmic portal that we're all coming through. And as I continued in my studies, I came across Queen Afua, who does a kemetic based womb healing, and she has a wonderful book, uh, Sacred Wisdom, and um, as well, the Arvigo Institute also, Dr. Arvigo put out a book called Sassoon, which is a wonderful read, and you read all about Don Eligio Panti, the initial uh, Jimen, which is the, the, that was the medicine man, that was the name of medicine men, he men. Um, and so I started to expand kind of this idea. So if we actually, if we base that truth, right, that all of us 
come from the womb and we base our societal health around that, what kind of society would we build? Right. Mm -hmm. If that was, if this was, if we base it on that fundamental truth. And then the other is, uh, you know, I was raised Catholic as well. I, I, I went away from the church just because of the inability to understand my body and just the shaming that I would find uh, when it came to menstrual cycles in Bible texts. And, and the truth is that I still use biblical te texts in my spiritual practice, and I still consider myself a Christian in many ways. I still have Jesus in my heart, but I also practice traditional shamanic-based um, healing practices. But the Hail Mary, you know, Hail Mary full of grace, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, right? And there's also a text uh, in the Gnostic text where uh, Jesus speaks to a woman and says, a woman who hasn't given birth and says, blessed are, are your breasts that have not brought forth milk and blessed is, blessed is your womb that has not given life. And so just these thinkings uh, and these ideas, I use that, that quote, um, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, and I and now I forget my own quote on the on the website. <laughs> the health of the woman is the health of the tribe, for her fruit is blessed. Yeah. So whether or not we have children, yes. um, you know, whatever fruit we are creating, when we are in alignment with our health, with our womb health, mm -hmm. and the other aspect of it, you know, those of us that lead that menstrual blood is ancestral, that menstrual blood is elemental, because the other truth, Emily, right, is that if every person is gestated in the womb, then every human, every, all the human blood on this planet came from the womb, came from a female body. You know, the female body is what's applying that blood. And so the blood that's in our veins is the blood that came from our mother's our grandmothers and so on and so on. And so in this way, when we have our menstrual cycle, we have an ancestral connection as well as an elemental connection, the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the thoughts we have. And so it's, it's never ending. Oh, that's the kind of stuff, like I feel it in my spine. <laughs> you know, when you think of the, the, just like the tribe that's yeah. behind me and that is yet to come, whew, that's some amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for explaining what you, why you put that there. It makes perfect sense. Um, and what we're talking about today is um, we're talking about trauma and sexual trauma. And I feel like right now we're in a time of, I mean, we are, we are definitely all of us being tested in one way or another. There's a pandemic. There are uprisings that trigger all sorts of things, depending on where on the spectrum you stand, right? Many of us have been quarantined in some very unhealthy family situations that is bringing up all sorts of stuff as well. And we're not able to escape the old trauma or even the new trauma in the same way that we could before. And you mentioned something when you and I talked before, and correct me if I get this wrong, but I believe you said that in eight out of 10 of your patients and clients, whatever issue they come in with, um, the root cause is trauma. Did I get that right? Yeah, it's a rough estimate. Yeah, but I would, I would safely say eight out of 10, the 10 clients I had, it was rooted in some form of trauma, definitely. So can we talk a little bit about what effect trauma has on our relationship with life and just our fundamental beliefs um, about life? So that one is definitely, um, it's an involved question. <laughs> yes. but, you know, so it, it, there's, a, there's another concept that came out um, and it was called the ACE scores, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And uh, Nadine Burke is our, um, I think, our Sur Surgeon General of California. She's um, the state general. So Dr. Nadine Burke, um, she put out a TEDx, a TED Talk, not a TEDx, TED Talk, on when she was working in um, the San Francisco area of Bernal Heights and how she was seeing how all these people who had adverse childhood experiences had, um, they were more predisposed to chronic illnesses, like high blood pressure, heart disease type, diabetes, cancer in their later lives. So this is um, 
a deep effect, right? It's like the more intense stressful situations you have, it can affect your, phys- your physiology. And it's 10 questions. Um, and so now what happens with trauma is that it engages our survival response because if there's a traumatic uh, incident, normally what will happen is that we do not feel safe. There is something that happened that um, made us uh, kind of shut down. Our nervous system engaged in a certain way that benefited our survival because fast forward, you're now an adult and you're dealing with some reproductive health issues, you survived it, right? So your central nervous system engaged um, in a flight or fright was flight or flight response or a freeze response. So there's either you learn how to fight, either you learn how to shut down and stay small, or you shut down all of your bodily systems, right? In a certain way. And now I do have a theory that the freeze response works on a spectrum. The freeze response, this is a lot of information, but the freeze response is engaged through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve has two, uh, it's a frontal vagus nerve, it's a dorsal vagus nerve. The frontal vagus nerve innervates our eyes, innervates um, our tongue, our esophagus, and it innervates all the way down to all of our visceral organs, um, lungs, heart, diaphragm even, uh, gallbladder, spleen, liver, uh, all the way down to our reproductive organs, you know, our womb, our our uterus, or our prostate, um, you know, all the way down to the vulva and the clitoris, and it's the same for any other gender. So it's going to innervate all of the visceral organs. And in a freeze response, it's like a deer in a headlights. You don't move. And so the vagus nerve can freeze the bodily function of our systems, right? And I feel like it can do that on a spectrum as well. It could freeze maybe the functions of the liver more so than it did the stomach. It can freeze the functions of the ovaries more so than it did the intestines, or it can affect the intestines. But, you know, so that's, that's my thinking. Um, and many different folk types of medicine, like traditional Chinese medicine, Mesoamerican medicine, uh, or Ayurvedic medicine, um, Korean, even, you know, Nordic types of folk medicine, there's an understanding that organs have um, emotions, different organs will respond to different emotions. And so when you go to traditional healers in this way, they will palpate you, they will read energy lines, and they will feel like, okay, there's a blockage here more so than a blockage there. And so trauma, if it's not addressed, if it's not healed, can have these lingering effects on our physiology, on our endocrine function, on our metabolic function, um, and then also it, um, it, it doesn't, if we stay stuck in a certain trauma state, it does not allow us to engage into uh, relationships from a, a foundation of safety. We begin to engage in relationships from a foundation of survival. How, you know, how am I going to survive this, this situation? What is my benefit here? And at the most kind of like meta analysis of it or at the most existential perspective of it, we can take that and consider what is our relationship with existence? What is our relationship with life? What, what is our relationship with even being alive? Do we feel safe here in this world? And if we do not, how are we addressing that? How are we helping this healing take place where we feel safe, right? And so it's pretty interesting right now is to ask this question during this pandemic, during what we're seeing right now. Wow. That was like, mic drop. Yeah. Stop the recording (laughs) right there. That's... um, yeah, I, I'm so grateful that you mentioned the ACE score to me when you and I talked uh, connected over the phone. I had never heard of it. Um, so I, I went and looked at the 10 questions and um, I think I had like three close to four of them, yeah. which, is, which is quite a bit. But, you know, it just actually took a, like a load off my shoulders because it helped me understand 
um, which I've already partly understood through therapy and all the healing modalities that I have in my life. But it was like, now it was like on paper, like it was a score. I could check off four of them and then just go, okay, no wonder that I have this fight or flight and sometimes freeze reaction to, to life. Um, and I feel like when we begin to understand that it's so much easier to step onto this path of healing, um, and, not be stuck in the trauma and also not to judge it and just know that that's there. That is part of my story, but there is something, I have a choice. There is something that I can do about it. And another thing that you said is that the incidents obviously won't go away. They were there. They, they happened. Whatever happened to us happened. We can't make them go away. What we can do is that we can learn how to live with our trauma and how to begin, how to begin the healing Um, so I think this is another big question, but what is one way of doing that? And there was another question from our, from our amazing community. Somebody said, it was such a great question. Um, uh, I actually want to say is, let me see here. Yeah. She said, do you have to do one exact thing to get over or work through trauma or does it vary from person to person? So how do you find your specific healing journey? Is it the same for all of us or is it different? What are some options for us? It's not the same for everyone. It is different. Um, you know, and with this pandemic, um, I've been spending a lot of time with family and, you know, my own family healing has been coming up. And I think I'll share maybe a little bit of um, what is mine to share and what I can easily share about my family's healing journey. Please. Um, I root my healing journey. I have rooted it in spirituality and in God that, you know, so I've never tried to, to mislead any of my clients. You know, my work has always been spiritual and physical at the same time. I, you do need to understand endocrine function. You do need to under, understand parasympathetic, sympathetic responses. You do need to know anatomy if you're going to be in this work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a spiritual component about having babies, right? There's a spiritual component about getting pregnant. There's a spiritual component about existence that is very unknown. And so I do work with that too. And in the unknown is where I place my faith, is where my faith comes from. Because I've had many experiences that were uh, divine intervention. And so in that way, I feel blessed. I feel like, okay, God has shown me divine intervention. And so I know there's a truth to, to my prayers. I know there's a truth to my mantras or my chanting or, you know, whichever way I go. Um, so everything is very unique per client, you know, and I think that is the role of a doctor. That is the role of an acupuncturist, the role of a healer is that you get to know the, the inequalities of your client in probably the same way as a mother gets to know their child, right? You're not going to like cookie, you know, you're not going to raise every single child the same way. Your children are going to have some, you know, subtle differences and big differences. And you have to accommodate that for them to flourish. And so in the same way, um, you know, so when you see a therapist and see any, anybody that you're looking for help, they should be skilled enough to find your uniqueness, to find what helps you. Right. And so with trauma recovery for some uh, athletic endeavors, you know, training for a triathlon or running or lifting weights is going to be an excellent form of, um, of coping. It's going to be an excellent trauma recovery right. uh, foundation. Right. Uh-huh. And for maybe someone else, art, you know, getting into an artistic practice or journaling or writing or poetry. You know, so there are subtle differences to how you can go about healing trauma. Um, but in the indigenous view of things, um, from Mesoamerican to the Northern American ways, um, there are sweat lodges, right? There are temascales, uh, there are fire ceremonies, there are community gatherings, or people come together in groups to do healing. And so you do healing and you cry and you pray and maybe you give offerings to your prayers. Maybe there's a fire and 
uh, you come and you bring flowers and or you write something of what you want to release and you give it to the fire. And in these ways, it's, it's like a physical, tangible thing that you can walk yourself through. And that experience is nonverbal. You, you can't give words to what that experience is going to be for any particular person. And right. yeah. that person has to walk through that experience in order to find that particular healing because, you know, they will have a different thought come into their mind that you or I will have, right? Mm-hmm. My sisters will have a different thought. My, my nieces, my, my mother, my, my brothers, my father, you know, any one of them will have a different thought if they were to do a, a ceremony in that way. But what you did is in, you know, in, in many, many different um, indigenous families and tribes is you came together with fire, with ceremony. And then afterwards you cried, you released, you purified, and then you ate, and then you sang, and then you danced, and then you enjoyed, and then you gave thanks, and then you were in gratitude. And that doesn't mean that the trauma you wrapped up the trauma and you put a bow on it and it was over. It meant you acknowledged it and it meant you processed it. Mm-hmm. So then the lingering effects had a communal space to work themselves out through, you know, because maybe the next day uh, you ask for forgiveness or, or you forgave someone, but, you know, there's still something that hurt you or you still remember and then there's guilt but you now have a foundation to be able to work it through. You can go back to the fire or maybe you can go back to the song or the prayer that came to you. Right. A lot of different ways. Imagine if we did more of that though. How amazing it like in our tribe, in our community, if we did that kind of healing together without even questioning it, where it's just part of, it's part of life. Yeah. Um, so beautiful. And also I feel like my experience is that, that when I open up to one path of healing, many other doors tend to just open up. I don't have to search for it. It is not always a Google search (laughs) for healing. It's just like the, the opportunities appear and we just need to be available to see, to see, to see them come to us. Exactly. Um, so I'm thinking about the role of the family as we're talking about community and such. A lot of trauma, of course, both whatever trauma it is and and specifically sexual trauma, a lot of that happens within the family. Um, Or it may not, but of course, you know, we are a person, we're part of a family, so it will affect the family and the family will affect us and our trauma. So can we talk a little bit about the role of the family, because also some of the questions from our amazing community is how can I show up and be an ally when a loved one has a trauma or what do I do when nobody understands me and nobody's there to hold space for my trauma, you know, on both, on both sides of, of the, of the trauma. Um, What is something that we can do? So this, that part is, is very tricky, you know, because, Sometimes when there is trauma in the family, our own family isn't safe. Absolutely. Us, right? yeah. And so that part is, is tricky because, you know, if we, if we keep this and talk about adults, like I'm an adult and I'm living with my family, then it's a different thing. But mm-hmm. if there's children involved, um, then it becomes, you know, then it becomes a different thing. Um, so we'll keep this in the terms of, of, Adults, right? If I'm an adult and my family isn't safe, and um, or how do I do this healing? So one of the the hard truths right now um, is that there's a lot of acceptance that we need to do, right? We need to accept um, a lot of ways that the way things are. We need to accept how our families are. We can't change any one person. So we right. Can't change anyone that's and we can't remember <laughs> yeah and we also can't change certain situations mm-hmm. right um but what we always can change is ourself and we can always change our thought patterns and so when we're addressing trauma on an individual level it requires a tremendous amount of bravery 
and courage because when you are going down the path of feeling your own trauma without support of your family, you will traverse a landscape of your psyche. You will traverse uh, a landscape of your ancestral trauma because sometimes we're carrying trauma that is not just ours. We could be carrying our mother's trauma. And this is um, something that's being found through Dr. Bruce Lipton's work and perinatal psychology. You know, as we inherit our mother's blood, we also inherit her neurotransmitters, her hormones, her experiences, right? And sometimes we're carrying our father's trauma or the trauma within those, those bloodlines and seed lines. And if you are faced with a family that isn't doing the work, um, as well, then you are tasked with being a major game changer in your ancestral lineage. And it is highly rewarding. It is highly fulfilling, but it is very, very daunting. And I want to give you the sense of having bravery and courage. You know, when I was going through my trauma, when I came out of a certain um, dark place, I think it was right after I had uh, been diagnosed with a cervical polyp and I had to get it surgically removed. And then shortly after there was an HPV diagnosis and I'm like, now you need to come in for a biopsy. And in my lineage, I had an, an aunt who died of um, ovarian cancer or uterine cancer. And then there was people in my family who had full hysterectomies because of cancer. And so I was scared, I was scared. And um, I had to really go in deep to figure out how I'm gonna do this healing. And it came really clear to me um, that the resonance or the vibration that I was carrying in my pelvic space and my womb space came from my own sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. So I did a deep dive with that and um, you know, I, I asked for forgiveness, you know, it, by myself, like in prayer and meditation and through journaling. Um, and it still has been very difficult for me to give the forgiveness. But when I came out of that certain phase, I remember thinking, wow, that was a very dark tunnel. And I know that a lot of people don't survive that dark tunnel, right? A lot of People don't, they succumb to drugs, they succumb to death in certain ways. Um, and I told myself, I wanna be a hand at the end of the tunnel, helping women out, helping mm -hmm. people out. And that's when I'm more fully committed to this work because if you are dealing with trauma, it is, it is one of our greatest tasks of evolution to start to heal this right now. You know, um, ah, this is, I was supposed to look this up last night and I wanna share this part right now. Um, there is an anthropologist, I think the documentary was on Netflix, but I'll give you some keywords so any of you can look it up. Basically, they found um, a skeleton at the bottom of a cenote in Mexico. Uh, and I forget which part of Mexico. So it's those beautiful blue cave-like cenotes. And they had to excavate the skeleton. And then they found that the skeleton was 30,000 years old and it belonged to a woman. Wow. And there was a, there's an anthropologist or an archaeologist in Oregon who came down to study the skeleton. Like he was like, oh my God, I get to do it. And because he has been studying old skeletons. And so, you know, we think, um, you know, BC, it's been 2020 years. At, you know, AD, right? So that's what, that's 2000, right? So let's think of 30,000 year old skeleton. And one of the things that he found when he was examining her was that her left forearm was broken, like it had healed in a spiral break. And he's like, this is a, a break of an interpersonal, interpersonal violence. This is a domestic violence. Somebody probably pulled her arm and her arm broke. And the truth of the matter is, is, and he said it, he's like, you see this often in all the elder, all these old bones, all these 30,000 year old bones, we see signs of interpersonal violence, 
of breakage of you know broken bones and that just like hit me it's like oh my gosh we have been doing this since the beginning yeah right you know and what this pandemic is showing us right now emily is like we haven't healed a 30 percent rise in domestic violence Mm -hmm. because now we're together when mm-hmm. when us coming together, they, we should have been healing, but we don't have the tools for healing. We, we, we've lost them or we haven't had the will to evolve them. And it's interesting because everybody's like, this is the new normal or going back to normal. It's like, oh my gosh, and I'm starting to feel this. Like, is it normal for us to, to divert to violence? And maybe it is. And so this is a call for our evolution. Mm. Yep. That brings to mind another thing that you and I talked about um, over the phone, because I said sometimes, you know, and I can only speak from my own, from my own perspective of just like, I know healing needs to take space, but I just, uh, it's too much. I'm too tired. I don't feel inspired to do the work and you just get stuck in that. Like what I call is like, I just feel like suffocated and kind of paralyzed and I can't move. And I said, what do we do? Cause I know that a lot of people feel that feeling. They know that, that there is a way through it. Many people don't even know that there is a way through it, but even when we know, we don't even know where to begin and we just stop it. We just shut down. And you said that not having the inspiration is the sickness it is part of the sickness so just hearing you talk i mean it ignites a fire inside me of oh my goodness like we can take this on and evolve together but what would be what would you say to someone who's not quite there and still very much struggling with this feeling like a massive mountain that I cannot climb. Right. What is something we can do to just like fuel that so that we're moved towards at least starting the climb? Right. So simple, you know, it, it has to be simple. It has to be accessible. And, you know, one of the best ways that I do this is, is through redirection, right? Redirecting our thoughts. And it's always to grat- gratitude. You know, when we're there, can you name three things that you're grateful for? You know, always, you know, let's just, let's just get to three things. Um, and in my darkest times, you know, the blue sky was the only thing that I was grateful for, for the, the seeing green, green trees and seeing flowers. It's like, okay, I am grateful that I get to see this beautiful blue sky. I'm grateful that I get to see the trees and the flowers. Um, and this is something that I teach my, my siblings, kids, right? I teach them gratitude. And, and one of my nieces, She's like, yes, gratitude, not a bad attitude, you know? <laughs> and then that sometimes it's really hard for them to find gratitude or, or it's been for me. And um, I teach them that, you know, I'm like, you know, today I'm grateful for my earphones. I'm like, I love being able to plug in earphones. You know, today I'm grateful, um, you know, for, for my pencil or for this. And I also teach them that some, sometimes it's too hard for people to even be grateful. Yeah. You know, so being able to be grateful is something to be grateful for. Um, so it's this redirection of yes, counting our blessings. Yes. Being grateful, especially when we're at our lowest place, you know, when we're, when it's just so overwhelming and so dark and, um, we have to, we have to look for those lights. We have to look for that light. We, and gratitude is one of the best ways. Um, it really is. It really is. I know it sounds cliche, but it really, really is. And it is a practice that I do have every night, you know, even when I have like some bad nights and I'm just lying with my face in my pillow and I'm just like, all right, girl, three things. What are you grateful for? And it may take me a second but I pull them out. All right. At least I got those three things and I go to sleep, you know, um, because it, it is hard work right now for some of us. Yeah. I love that. I love that so much. Keeping it simple 
and finding those three things. I know that has helped me in some moments too. And it's, it's just easy enough to just do that. It's such a great starting place. Um, I would also love to talk about uh, postpartum. Um, I feel like just being pregnant and going through the birthing process and then being in the fourth trimester, it just, it, it brings up so much for both. I mean, for, for both partners, I knew it, I know it brought up things for me. It even brought up old trauma for my husband. It's, it's an experience that brings up a lot of things. And, um, I'm wondering how we can hold that old trauma that arises and possible new trauma that happened in the birth experience or during the pregnancy, whatever it might be. Um, how can we, how can we hold that as new parents? And especially when it comes to sexual trauma for anyone who has experienced sexual trauma, a lot of that can come up in pregnancy and birth. Uh, I'm throwing you so many big, hard questions <laughs> and you're doing amazing. I know they're massive, but can we, can we just touch on that? Um, Cause I know that a lot of mamas who are watching this will, will have had that experience or might still be very much in it. Yeah. How can we, let's maybe simplify it. How can we hold and heal sexual trauma specifically in pregnancy? and birth? How can we prepare ourselves and hold that? You know, uh, acknowledgement, acceptance, right? There's a book called When Survivors Give Birth. Um, I'll be honest that sometimes when you read trauma books or books about sexual trauma, um, you can get re-triggered. Um, so you must proceed lightly and proceed gently. If you do have sexual trauma and you know of it and you're aware of it, I do highly, highly highly recommend um, to see a, get a therapist, you know, to find somebody to work with. If you don't want to get a therapist, find a medicine person or spiritual person or a Reiki practitioner that is experienced or a hypnotherapist, you know, and make sure that they're experienced and you can get good referrals from them uh, to, for you to talk to and to help walk you through this. So when I do my work, <clears throat> For me, it has to be about getting into the body. So um, whenever I work with anybody who has sexual trauma and um, they're preparing for labor, I do very detailed meditations into their anatomy. So this is something anybody can do, you know, and all it requires is for you to start learning your anatomy, start looking up at, at anatomy, um, you know, websites or get an anatomy book. Uh, there's a great, um, gosh, and my, I don't know if it, I'm not getting old, but I forget a lot of things now. <laughs> oh, me too. It was like, there's just access. There's, and I have it right behind me. I'd have to get it, but there's a great, a, a detailed anatomy book on women's anatomy. And it was, um, gosh, a, a new view, a new view of a woman's body. There we go. Nice. Yeah. So starting to look at this anatomy and then looking at your own body and let me just grab my my model real quick yes so you know you have uh, my, the kids my my family's kids come in and, and they love playing with this <laughs> what an incredible way to learn if you can't start too soon oh, i love that <laughs> fall <it> apart <laughs> they take it apart and put it back together so when you start to understand your anatomy, you know, all parts of your anatomy, the next state, the next step is to start to breathe into this area, to start to get a mental image and a physical connection into this part of your body. And so in this way, you start to reclaim it. This part of your body does not belong to the trauma anymore. It does not belong to the memories and does not belong to that incident you start to reclaim this through breath and through mind awareness, you know, so conception, con conceiving, um, you know, the con conception is also an idea, not just uh, an act of fertilization, but uh, to have concepts, it begins in the mind, it's the thought. So if we can imagine our connection to our body, that's the beginning. So even if you don't, okay, I'm, I'm trying, I'm breathing in, I don't really feel anything, it's numb. 
simply having the imagination can begin it, can begin the process, okay? Because we don't create buildings until we imagine them first. Right. Very so good point. Mm -hmm. That's one really good way. So healing doesn't happen unless we imagine it. So if you do have sexual trauma, if you are pregnant, beginning to learn as much as of your anatomy and feeling it and breathing into it and being conscious of the bones, of the muscles, of the ligaments, that is a number one empowerment, empowering step to take because you begin to claim your body back. You begin to claim the autonomy of this space. Mm -hmm. and you can have more detailed awareness of your bodily function as you go into labor, right? You can breathe in to all the details of the vulva. You can breathe into the cervix. You can breathe into the cervix as it's effacing. You know, you can be very, very much an active participant of your labor at that point. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely one way. Um, real quick, I think you asked a question. Someone, um, someone had asked a question of how to be an ally yeah. uh, to somebody who has trauma. And I think the best way to be an ally to somebody who has trauma is to study about trauma or get your, you know, find a therapist or find another person, maybe, you know, one to three sessions of learning how to hold space for somebody that has trauma because it can be very difficult. The person who has trauma can be a very can be difficult it can be a difficult situation at times so it requires um you know a strong reserve of spiritual strength of energetic strength to to be an ally and it's a worthy thing to do it's a beautiful thing so if any of you are thinking of being an ally to anybody that's been traumatized i applaud you i thank you and you aren't necessary and 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 i and very grateful for you to do that because we need more people to start stepping into these roles of healing, of helping people heal. Even if it's not professional, even if you're just helping your family heal, it's mm -hmm. very, very honorable. So I say thank you. Mm. Yes, I so agree. Thank you for that question and for that answer. Um, here's another question from a mama who says, I recently lost a baby girl at four months along. We send you so much love, first of all, and thank you for, for talking to us about it. And then she says, how do women find the courage to try again? You know, I think one thing that is lacking in our society is postpartum care, adequate postpartum care. Oh, yeah. Um, people feel that just because you had a loss, you had a miscarriage, um, or you, you had a stillbirth, that you don't require that postpartum care. And you very much do. And, um, you know, postpartum care is about attending to the mama, attending to somebody who has just given birth, who has just lost a birth. And you attend to them by having them rest, giving them nourishing foods, wrapping their bellies and their hips, um, massaging them making sure they're okay. And traditionally, all over the world, including uh, my country that my family's from, Guatemala, and, you know, all parts of Mesoamerica, parts of Northern Europe, all of Southeast Asia, everywhere. There was a tradition that at the end of the six weeks, at the end of the 40 days, um, you did a hip closing ceremony. Mm -hmm. So you closed the energy centers of a woman's body with traditional cloths and it's, it's so uncanny so uncanny how this, these tradition these traditions are cross-cultural you know textiles are cross-cultural and so you would wrap a woman in in loving you know sacred cloths and you would close her energy centers you would close her hips close the skull you would close the bones of the legs so she was now complete mm. you know some traditions have a slap bath that they bathe the woman and they, and they slap them with herbs. Some don't do the slap bath. They just do a hot water bath uh, with herbs on the, on the, on the woman and the baby. Um, 
But I have used these traditions in helping in birth loss and in trauma recovery, including the hip closing ceremony. Um, so I'm not sure where, where she is located. But, you know, in this way, we can start uh, awakening this healing. She can find someone or she or her and her friends or her family members. You know, you can, you know, look through your lineage. Where was, where was this? Where can we find a semblance of this? And let's call it back in. Let's do it again. Mm. You know, um, there's rituals also. I know in the Buddhist traditions, there's these little baby statues that were placed in the home when there was loss. Oh. Um, or you place them in the garden. Um, so there's always, you can always have like an altar to the little baby soul that was lost. And I think really taking your time. And, and that's another thing that I would do um, in session is guide women uh, through their womb and to talking to their baby uh, that was lost in some way. And I would guide them to having an, an altar, you know, for as long as they wanted to, so they can keep connecting. And until that soul baby said, okay, it's time for me to go, or you can place me now in the garden and you can, you know, just keep me in a special place. Um, the babies are never forgotten. You know, we, we had a loss in my, in my family, my siblings, um, there was a loss at six months mm. and we've never forgotten that baby. We still call him by name. Mm. You know? And remembering that soul is, is okay. And you'll always remember this baby up until, you know, up until you die. Women never forget. And it's that honoring. It's, you know, we, we've lost that, right? We've lost this ability to honor anything from birth to death uh, to celebrations in, in a deep and profound way. Uh, so finding your way to honor this experience that you've had is going to be important. You know, doing a ritual around it, taking care of yourself in a deep way, um, and letting, letting life tell you when you're ready. You will be ready. You will. I've helped so many women have a baby after a loss like this. And right now, you know, having more babies to bring more healing into this world is probably one of the most beautiful things we can do. Mm. <sighs> Thank you. That, that, was, that was beautiful. And I hope that that helps you. Whoever asked that question and whoever needed it. Um, to go back, this is, this is tied to what you just talked about, but to any, I mean, so many of us, we have no idea what these old, beautiful traditions are, right? We're just like a modern woman in the Western world, um, and we have no idea. And <laughs> nobody tells us about these things. Very few of us know just how sacred and special that fourth trimester is and that we have the right to be taken care of. And, yeah. and all of, it's just like, no, just like bounce back quickly, get back to work, do your thing. And there's just like the sacredness of it and the honoring of the body and what it has just done is just like, it's just gone. It's gone missing. Yeah. And we need to reconnect to that. So what, what are some things that a, a new mama can do or the family of a new mama can do for her in, in uh, celebrating and honoring the body? I mean, you already talked plenty about the, the wrapping, which is, which is so beautiful. But what's another way that a, that a woman can take care of herself um, postpartum? Uh, well, you know, Pre-planning, right? So in the nesting phase, definitely uh, planning who she wants around. Mm. Um, that's number one. And, Huge. <laughs> and then, you know, talking to her partner um, and talking to their spouse about this and being, you know, making, ensuring that the partner or the spouse or whoever's going to be a primary caregiver can help support that, can be the manager. For that of who's going to be coming in and out and for her to you know set that up um prior to giving birth like who's going to be able to come in and i know right now with the pandemic you know people will need to quarantine and things like that so you have to really really pre-plan um the foods you want to eat you know you may not know what you're going to have an appetite for but you probably you might know what you're going to want to want to eat you know 
So plan out your meals. Um, there's great books. I know, you know, Kimberly and she wrote yes. a book the sister. and then there's also a wonderful book, the first 40 days. And I'm actually featured in their second book um, on awakening fertility, but the first 40 days, the golden month, those are all great books that you can start looking through uh, to find recipes. There's a book called mother food on breast milk. Um, you know, you have to do a little bit of research right now, you know, and I think this is really, really, really important because we're, you know, we're still kind of living in this way where it's like doctor knows best and teacher knows best and all these people know best. So let me find somebody else that knows best. And the truth of it is, is that you're the one that needs to know best and you need to claim this and you do need to do your homework and do your research. And I know that that can be daunting at times and nobody wants to do this. That's part of the reason why we're in, you know, it's part of the colonization and part of the capitalistic structure is that we're so used to comfort. And if I can pay for it and maybe get a deal on it, I'll have access to it. But no, you got to do your work and you got to do your research. So you got to read your book. And Amenagog, not Amenagogs, um, gosh, see, mind. <laughs> it, so any food that help bring down, uh, you know, breast milk, you know, there's this great book called Mother Food, and it it writes in there and how some of our earlier agricultural ways they were they were growing food that actually created more breast milk. Uh -huh. Right? It's like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So research food that is going to create more breast milk, you know, for you, and see what you might like, and maybe it's food you're already eating. You know, so pre-plan your meals. Who's going to cook them? Freeze them. You know, and so who, whoever's around, and it's not just about coming over to take care of the baby. It's about coming over to help with the cleaning, the, you know, the doing of the laundry and the cooking mm -hmm. and to help you. Maybe, you know, you, you don't know what might happen. You know, we're, we're all hoping for a really successful and, and easy birth that you don't have a lot of recovery from, but you might need assistance. So you want people around that are going to be willing to do that. And you want people around that you're not going to feel ashamed if your boobs come out, you know? So all of that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the hip binding, the belly binding, I'm not paid through the Sorola Association, but the Sorola belt is my favorite hip binder because it has Velcro. You can take it on and off and then you can belly bind with another way. So I... Uh, guide my clients to doing two things to belly bind and then to hip bind and to having separate things so the hip bind will go underneath uh, around the pelvis and then the belly bind will go on top mm -hmm. and so the hip bind right. you can take off fairly easy when you got to go to the bathroom and you can put it right back on and then the belly bind will stay on um so i do two two with my clients yeah um, you know i i sell vaginal steaming stools um, I do love vaginal steaming. I don't think they should be used for infections. I, I'm like, I know what they can do. I've been doing this for a long time. Vaginal steaming won't cure everything, but it's really helpful in postpartum. If you don't have access to vaginal steaming stool, sit back. They've been around for a long time. Really, really good stuff. They're awesome. You know, um, learning some basic herbs, some more research, more empowerment. You know, but some good herbs, roses, chamomile, calendula, witch hazel, adding salt. Salt's always very good for healing. Uh, so you can do sit baths regularly to help in uh, healing hemorrhoids uh, right after the, the a perennial tear has been healed. You can use it fairly well. Um, the hip binding and the steaming uh, can help with bringing down the size of the uterus. You know, so you, you know, you can, you can see what you want to incorporate, yeah. um, but you got to plan it out and you have to ensure you're the authority of this, you know, you're, and see, and this is the other thing, Emily, and it's like, we've been, we've been so detached from our true nature as women in a sense of our femininity. And this is the one thing that, that, we, that we've forgotten is that leadership is an innate quality to being a female because when you're running a household when you're taking care of kids and when you're gathering you know ensuring that you have resources that takes a lot of leadership that takes task management uh you know 
it, 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 you have to have a certain brain that can see a lot of things and know what needs to be done. And it is a leadership brain. So embrace that right now. You are just dating and you're about to have a baby, but you can let your brain also, you know, bloom and help you in planning your postpartum period because it is involved, you know, and the sacred container is usually 40 days to six weeks. Uh, if you had a cesarean section, it'll be a little longer. Um, but that time is magical. And that time, that is the foundation to our trauma healing too, Emily. Mm. You know, this, if, if we are facing, you know, every birth, every time someone gives birth, they are given this care automatically, no questions, no debates. Is it passing the Senate? Blah, blah, blah. No, this is what happens. The governments in Malaysia allow for postpartum care for six weeks. You know, this is our right. It's a human need. Everyone deserves it. Everyone. Everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that can change the game. That yeah. can change what we're doing here you know, on a worldwide level, right? So going back, if we base the way we build society on the truth that everybody's born from the uterus, what kind of society would we have? Oh, that is wisdom. May we all begin to ask that question because that will change things. Mm -hmm. It will fundamentally change things. Yeah. You are such a gem. I just want to keep going. I have so many <laughs> questions that we didn't get to, but this is so beautiful. It just means that we're going to have to do this again. Um, Marcia, um, on behalf of me, my company, and I'm sure everyone listening, thank you so much for sharing so much of your wisdom and your light and your love and your passion for this. We have so much to learn from you. Oh, um, and thank you for sharing all the other resources, the, the belts, the books, all of the yeah. things. And we're going to, we're going to create an email to put all of this together so that mamas and women or anybody who, who is interested in this can also read and kind of get the bullet points of, of what we've been talking about. So, um, also a huge thank you to those of you who sent in questions. I hope that there will be another opportunity for us to get to many of these questions, but I really appreciate your vulnerability and your strength in asking and talking about the real stuff. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Marcia. So much love to you. Where can people find you? You're on Instagram. Is it at, um, at Women's True Healing? At Women's True Healing on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active. And there's a link there so you can get to my newsletter. And so I send a newsletter out right now about every two to three months, but it's usually, usually chock full of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll sign up, I'll sign up to my um, newsletter as well. I have a Facebook page and on my Facebook page, I'll put out articles that I'm not able to put out on IG. So, you know, if I share a good article, uh, one good article I just shared real quick was um, that during the pandemic, there was a drop in premature labor. And so they're starting to, they really want to study that because they're like, oh, wow, you know, maybe women feeling staying home and not rushing mm. to do stuff, maybe really kept them in a good place. You know, there's, there's really interesting. Yeah, so I shared that article on, on uh, the Facebook page. Is that Women's True Healing as well on Facebook? Yeah, Women's okay. True Healing on Facebook, Women's True Healing on IG. I have a meetup also that I'll, um, on IG and Facebook and meetup, uh, that's where I'll post any events and any Zoom classes. Um, so you can follow any and all. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Go do it, guys. Marcia, thank you again so much for your time. We appreciate you so much. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Mwah.